No matter how big the stage gets or how brightly the spotlights shine, climbing will always have its roots as a counterculture activity. Tracing back to the early days of the sport where legends like Warren Harding and Joe Brown drove hard routes up obscure cliffs, climbing has always had a bit of an anti-establishment, rebellious base to it. As the sport began to grow and gain popularity, this identity began to cause some friction. Skirting the law and living off of scraps doesn't exactly go hand to hand with brand deals and the Letterman show. To me, this has always represented one of the biggest conflicts in climbing, managing the outlaw, follow no rules attitudes of the early pioneers, along with modern concepts like safety, fame, and environmental conservation. It's a hard balance to strike, and perhaps no climber skirted that line more than Dean Potter. Dean Potter rose to fame at a seminal time in rock climbing history. He was like something out of time, a free soloing, long haired hippie that was plucked from the 60s and thrown into the spandex wearing, grey chasing sport craze of the turn of the millennium. Dean was an injection of boldness and rebellion that some worried had been lost in the sport and this vaulted him into climbing fame but also into controversy as he free soloed, speed climbed and slacklined his way to forever having his name etched into climbing lore. Hey guys, welcome to Conquistadors, a new series where I wanted to look at some of rock climbing's greats and the impact they had on the sport. This is episode 1 and we're looking at Dean Potter. I chose Dean because I see him as a representation of what is, to me, one of the biggest conflicts in rock climbing. The idealized image of a dirtbag climber, an image that I think lots of us hold in pretty high regard, comes with a lot of caveats and isn't sustainable on a larger scale. If we all climbed the way that the old legends did, rock climbing would be a lot less prevalent, a lot more dangerous, and do a lot more damage. I'm getting ahead of myself though. First, let's talk about Dean. Born to an army officer in Kansas who later moved to a military base in New Hampshire, Dean's climbing career was dangerous and rebellious from the start. Without a harness and using some clothing line dug up from a friend's garage, he learned to climb on the cliffs nearby his father's military base, where the activity was actually banned due to military law. At 6 foot 5, strong and absolutely fearless, he flourished as a climber. For most of the 90s, Dean was a classic dirtbag. Summer spent at the golf course, chasing weather and rocks wherever he could, living off of scraps and salt sandwiches just to get by. Even in the early days of his career, there's evidence of some of the contradiction that is Dean Potter. He saw no reason that he shouldn't climb on the cliffs at the military base, so he went and climbed them, despite the fact that it was illegal. However, years later, when he'd become a bit of a local legend at the Hueco Tanks, friend and climbing partner Bronson McDonald describes Dean as extremely anal in terms of enforcing the leave no trace ethics of other climbers and caring for the routes of the area. He didn't flaunt rules just for the fun of it, he had his own moral code and he followed it really carefully. Finally, after a decade of honing his skills and developing his own particular brand of climbing, Potter began to gain recognition for his skill, strength, and uniqueness. His name started to grow, and with it, he brought along his own particular brand of climbing. One that was fast, light, and like everything else he did, dangerous. This new style embodied Dean's no rules mantra. He didn't care what other established climbers in the 90s were going for. He just did what he felt was right, and what felt right was a series of hard, daring ascents in Yosemite and on other famous big walls. He was sprinting up day-long multi-pitches, soloing hard routes, and doing things that no other climber at the time could dream of doing. Along with his physical achievements, Potter had a bit of a reputation for his unique mentality. He was highly spiritual and cared lots about his mental state and his connection with nature. He was less concerned with grade chasing and more worried about finding the climbs and lines that he connected with on a deeper level. As climbing shifted in the 90s and 2000s, Potter was like an anchor, the last remnant of some of the older generations and the spirit that had embodied them. Along with his old school style though came controversy. Dean had his fair share of run-ins with park rangers, but he didn't take them too seriously. He viewed his relationship with the rangers as almost cordial. He did his job, which was to climb what he wanted to climb, and the rangers did their job, which was to chase him, but Dean would rub it in their faces that he got to climb, and they wouldn't hunt him too hard. He may have broken some rules here and there, but he wasn't really doing anything morally wrong. Not everyone agreed though. 
In 2006, Potter's habit of pushing the rules and living free would end up costing him dearly when he traveled to Arches National Park to climb Delicate Arch, one of the park's and Utah's most well-known landmarks. It wasn't technically illegal for him to do this climb, but the ascent drew a massive outrage from the climbing community and led to a series of blanket bans within the park that prevented new climbing routes from being established. Now, I'm sure everyone who's heard of this incident has their own opinion on whether it was right or wrong, there was even a rap song written about it. I have mine, definitely, but I don't think that controversy is really worth getting into here. What I do think is worth mentioning is how this one climb reflects, on a micro level, one of the core issues that I see in rock climbing. Dean framed the entire thing as a highly spiritual experience, this beautiful moment that he shared with nature and this unique rock formation. He didn't think he did anything wrong, even though he admitted that other climbers shouldn't follow in his footsteps due to the damage they might cause. This is the core issue that I was trying to get at in the beginning of this video. On an individual level, it's fun to play into this image of the outlaw climber running around national parks in the dark and climbing untouched faces that you're not supposed to climb just so you can connect with yourself on a deeper level. If everyone did this though, the damage would add up quickly and it wouldn't be sustainable. Now, I want to make it clear that I'm not necessarily criticizing Dean for climbing Delicate Arch. I've read up on his climb and he went through painstaking measures to ensure he didn't damage the rock in any way. The fact remains though that no matter how careful Potter was on this climb, if enough people copied him, the cumulative effects of it would eventually damage and maybe break the formation. And that's kind of the contradiction that I'm trying to get into here. The delicate arch climb would cost Dean his sponsorship, some favor within the climbing community, and arguably his marriage. Throughout all of it, he remained stout in his belief that he did nothing wrong and he stayed true to his morals and his climbing style. In the years after Utah, he would go on to line up some of the most impressive ascents that the climbing world has ever seen. The speed record on the nose, a parachute solo of Deep Blue Sea on the Eiger, numerous death-defying slacklines and base jumps and free solo routes. The list of Dean Potter's incredible, terrifying stunts is far too long for me to even try to cover in this video. Potter never changed after the delicate arch incident, for better or for worse. When he did pass away, it was in true Dean Potter form, performing an illegal base jump in Yosemite Valley, the place where so many of his historic ascents had happened. Dean's legacy, to me, is one of the most interesting ones in climbing. For a brief period in the 2000s, he got some flack from fellow climbers who thought he was somewhat of a fraud, a celebrity who liked the spotlight and only put on this deep, meditative persona when the cameras were on, while he went around flaunting rules and climbing whatever he wanted. Those who were close to him though have always disputed this, pointing to things like the decade he lived as a penniless dirtbag or the weeks leading up to his deep blue sea climb, where he spent most of his time meditating in a cave while waiting for the weather to clear. They also again point back to that strict moral code and the care that Dean took to not do any unnecessary harm while he was climbing. More than anything, I think Dean was a somewhat necessary injection of wildness into the world of climbing. As much as I love bolted routes and the Olympics and all the ways in which the sport is growing, I do think it's good to have people who hail from that somewhat older generation where risks were higher and the lines were a little bit bolder. Whether or not you agree with his ethics, Dean did just that, and along the way, he carved his name as one of the greatest rock climbers that we've ever seen. Alright guys, thank you so much for watching. All revenue from this video is getting donated right to the Access Fund to promote safe and accessible climbing across the United States. Let me know in the comments if you have any climbers who you think helped change the legacy of the sport because I would love to learn more about them. I hope you enjoyed the video and I will see you next time.